The world of Parasport is more than medals and accolades. Join hosts Greg Westlake and Travis Morrow as they delve deeper and examine the important issues impacting sport. This is Beyond the Field. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Travis Morrow. Classification is the cornerstone of the Paralympic movement. It determines which athletes are eligible to compete in a sport and how athletes are grouped together for competition. In this episode of Beyond the Field, we dig into the topic of classification and discuss its importance and some of its challenges. Later in the show, Greg will speak with Canadian Paralympian judoka Priscilla Gagne about the classification in her sport. But first, my conversation with wheelchair rugby classifier Paul Easton. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, no problem. Glad to be here. Thanks. So Paul, can you tell me, how did you start being a classifier for wheelchair rugby? Uh, it actually started in 1998 for me, um, kind of dates me a little bit, but uh, I started with a course in university and it was uh, physical activity for people with disabilities. And there was a list of 20 or 30 different programs within the Halifax area where I went to school and we just had to randomly pick one. I ended up picking up wheelchair sports, wheelchair rugby, and went to their first practice to learn a little bit about it. And one of the players said, you know, if you stick with it, we need classifiers, we need people like you, it'll take you lots of places. And that's really where it all started for me. I finished the course and then just continued on with uh, rugby in Nova Scotia and then it, it ballooned from there. Wow, so you've been in the sport since 98. That's longer than me, holy moly. So Paul, can you take me through the process of uh, the classification of a wheelchair rugby athlete? What does that look like? Yeah, so there's, there's three main components to it. Uh, the first one uh, we used to call the bench test, where you would interview the athlete, get some background information on uh, their injury diagnosis, uh, how they got to, uh, to the actual uh, rugby event. You then go through some manual testing of their range of motion and strength, right from head to toe. Uh, to see to see what's what's there from a, a physical functional capability, then we do very sport specific uh, assessments. Uh, you know, often things with the ball, how they interact with the wheelchair, what that looks like in isolation. So it's not with other athletes; it's just them and the classifiers. You know, how do they throw? How do they catch? How do they dribble? How do they uh, you know move left, right, and all those sorts of things. And then we take that information and then we do an on-court observation where they're actually in play and uh, uh, see how they interact with the, the other players on the court. And if those things that we see in the bench test and in the functional skills test, are we seeing that on court as well? Or do they actually function a little bit differently? Then we take those three things and put them all together to come up with a classification. Wow, so that sounds like a pretty thorough process. Now, when you see an athlete that maybe is not the right fit for rugby, functionally speaking, that must be a really difficult conversation. How do those go? Uh, it is. It, it, it's, it's becoming more common because there's a lot more interest in rugby, uh, let's say, as compared to 1998. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people are very interested in rugby, so we get a lot of different uh, folks thinking that they're eligible for the for the sport sometimes we have to make decisions where that particular player uh, although they may look like a rugby player and function somewhat like one if their abilities are a little bit too much uh, for the sport and the classification system we do have to say that they're not eligible uh, that's that's probably one of the most difficult aspects of being a classifier because you know it's something that they really want to do and we want to see people play um, but unfortunately, it's, um, we, we do have to class some people out. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, heading into Tokyo, we're hearing a lot of stories about people maybe overselling their level of impairment to achieve a favorable classification. How do you, how do you kind of weed that out during a classification, or are you on the lookout for that when you're classifying? Uh, yeah, that, that happens. Um, how do we weed that out? We're, we're, we're always classifying. We're always looking and seeing what the athletes are doing on and off the court. Uh, 
you know, through conversation with them or if you're in the meal hall or anything like that, you know, you can, you can observe function any time that you see, you see players. But really when it comes down to what you see on the court, it, it, it comes with a little bit of an experience and a, an attuned eye to, to seeing what makes sense for the person's diagnosis and does that add up to the bench test that we've completed and does that add up to the functional skills test that we did in isolation with them. Um, sometimes we'll see more function on the court and sometimes we'll actually see less function on the court and that will impact the overall classification. An example would be players with uh, cerebral palsy can function very well independently, but when you put them in the context of competition and the excitement in that, their function doesn't present the same and they don't play that way. So we take those things into account. That's actually a great example of cerebral palsy. I didn't even think about that. So why is it that classification and classifiers are so important in parasports and in particular wheelchair rugby? Why are we important? Um, we, provide, we provide a service, I guess, to assess athletes to ensure fair play. If everybody just showed up and played and we're like, you're on that team and you're on that team, teams could have different, different um, function on the court. Then they could stack their team and it wouldn't really be fair for the team that don't have players that have that type of function. So we basically provide a system that you can have players with a lower function and we can have players with higher function and they can all play together. We also have male and female players. Um, and so the system that we use allows them a, a large number of people to play on the same court and it actually makes it equitable uh, regardless of where your level of function is. An example would be if you have a 3.5 level of player who's, who's very high class, means lots of function, um, they can play on the court, but you can only have so many of them and you do need some low pointer players like the 0.5s and the 1.0s, so everybody actually gets an opportunity to get on the court. I think that's a great example and a, kind of a great answer because wheelchair rugby is one of those few sports where you see a bunch of different level of abilities coming together on the court and uh, on the same team. So classification plays a huge role in that. Do you think a lot of times maybe classifiers get unfairly scapegoated for, for kind of being the enforcers of a system that's maybe struggling to catch up with the new athletes that we're seeing? Uh, sure, sure you could say that. Uh, it, it's always good to have someone to blame if it's not going your way. Um, but the way I see that is if, if it's not going in their way f because of their diagnosis and the manual's not really meeting their needs, they provide the athletes, the team, the supporters, they provide that feedback to the classification panel. We then take that information and we pass that up to the, at the international level and that will get discussed. And through those discussions, we then create changes in the manual to then meet the needs of the sport and the athletes. So can we be a scapegoat for it? Sure, most people are pretty understanding that we're working the best we can and we're, we're working in a frame that we have right now. Hindsight's always 2020, right? Um, but it's an open loop of communication where we can always you know, take that information and put it to use and improve our system within rugby. Well, I think the vast majority of para-athletes uh, appreciate the work that classifiers do and realize how important they are to our to our continued uh, growth as a sport. So I think, I think uh, we'd like to thank you for all the work that you do uh, in the classification process, Paul. Hey, no problem, I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. It's taken me lots of places, like I said it would. Thank you so much for coming on and answering all of our questions and shedding a light into the classification process. Hey, no problem. Glad to have the opportunity and provide some insight into it. More to come on Beyond the Field. This is Beyond the Field. Welcome back, I'm Greg Westlake. Before the break, Travis spoke with Paul Easton about his role as a classifier and being on the lookout for people manipulating the system. Para Judo is a sport that has recently updated its rules around classification to combat people doing just that. Hard to believe, but it does happen. Earlier, 
I caught up with Canadian Paralympic silver medalist judoka Priscilla Gagne to discuss the recent changes in the para judo world and why they were needed. Priscilla, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Why don't you just do me a favor? Classification in para sports is something that doesn't get spoken about enough. And so can, can you just run us through how classification in para judo works? Sure. So the way it worked in the past was there's three divisions. So there's B1, B2, B3. B1 is the most severe visually impaired with no acuity and blind and less than 15 degrees of vision. Uh, B2 is kind of in between. You can still, you have some acuity and you have some degrees of field vision. B3 is the best that you can see while still being considered legally blind. Uh, so uh, that posed a lot of problems in the past and you had some less honest individuals coming in and, and you know, faking uh, the severity of their vision impairment. And so they've recently redone it. So the B3 division is completely eliminated, theoretically. Uh, then there's J1 and J2. So they're switching it from B to J, J for judo, which makes more sense. Uh, and then J1 is fully blind, no acuity, less than 15% of vision, uh, of degrees, excuse me, of degrees of vision. Uh, J2 is still legally, is still considered legally blind, low vision, and I wanna say the spectrum is 1.3. So if you see better than that, even by a decimal point, you will be declassified. In other words, if you see better than that, then they, they think that you should be able to, to compete in able-bodied judo. It sounds like this is a pretty big issue in your sport amongst you and your coaches, you and other athletes. Can you just talk about how serious of an issue this is? Absolutely. There are people uh, who show up to our circuits who are winning the competitions who go home and they have driver's license. They drive cars, they're fully sighted. They, they were carded athletes and national champions in their countries who are now showing up as quote, legally blind, B3 athletes, B2 athletes. And all of a sudden they're just crushing the competition in the Paris circuit. We'd never seen them before, you know? And so the, the question is one, how does somebody just show up for the first time internationally and just kill it and with such skill and have never competed internationally before with us? And two, how do you go, how do so many people go from a national team, national champions, European champions, to all of a sudden they're para, you know, and there's no articles about how they lost their vision. There's no big story. It's just all of a sudden they have a vision impairment. And it's, you know, so there's lots of questions there when somebody's getting classified, do you think you could look into, when you mentioned somebody has a driver's license, do you think that's how you catch some people that are cheating? Do you look into their personal life and their background a little bit more? Like, how do you catch the people that are gaming the system a bit? That, that's difficult, you know, because <laughs> that's a huge question uh, because we know that they can see, you know, they make eye contact from across rooms. In Rio, we were on the bridge that crossed this huge highway and we were on the walking bridge that they built for us. And my coach, Andre, he made eye contact with one of the other judo players that we didn't know was faking. They made eye contact and, this, and, he, and the person, the other player got really excited because he likes Andre. And he smiled and then he realized, oh my goodness, he just realized that I saw him and then he kept his head down, and wouldn't talk to him for the rest of the trip. So it's, it's things that are hard to prove on paper. How do you prove it? They, you know, how do you, how do you remove the players that are cheating when there are nations or systems that, are, that support that mentality? You know, it's really, really difficult to do. And what exactly has changed since the uh, Tokyo Games? As far as classifications go, uh, there's no more B3s. So for example, in the finals, I was against a B3. So I was a B1 uh, fighting a B3 from Algeria. She shouldn't be competing anymore because she was classified as B3 and they've been eliminated. Uh, so to give you a better idea, my, the one that I won to go into the finals was against Germany. She's a legitimately visually impaired athlete who has some sight, so she's B2. She would still be able to compete. So she'll be, she would be in, under the J2 category, but I would never compete against her again. So now it'll be J1s against J1s and J2s against J2s. I'm curious for you personally, from an emotional standpoint, how does it make you feel to know that people were cheating? So as an athlete, speaking strictly as an athlete, my, my mindset was, you think 
you're so arrogant that you think because you're fully sighted that you're gonna come and just destroy the blind circuit. And even if you win, I'm not gonna let you do it easily. You know, I will die trying to make your life miserable. <laughs> you're taking this huge opportunity away from someone who's actually blind. You know, you, and I'm speaking about the people who are cheating when I say you, have every opportunity to do what you can do in your life. You have all your vision. What do we have? We have parajudo, you know? But the sighted people are even taking that from them. So there is this huge sense of injustice that made me sad for them and, and brought a whole new deep level of, I really want to beat you. <laughs> because not only as an athlete, not only from the sport and spirit of sport, but I really want to beat you and defeat you because on behalf of all other blind people in around the world, you know, to show them nothing's impossible and don't 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 stop trying just because it's unfair or because it's being seemingly taken from you. I appreciate that, Priscilla. As you know, I'm a fan, and next time I see you, hopefully we're on the mat, I'll let you toss me on my head. Hey, well, I'll avoid your head, but I'll, I would love to toss you. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Beyond the Field. This is Beyond the Field. Welcome back, I'm Travis Morale, and I'm joined by my co-host, Greg Westlake, to talk about classification in para-sport. Greg, one thing that came out in both interviews is that people manipulate the system. As a Paralympian, how does that make you feel? Well, it, it's wild, because I come from a para-hockey background where there is no classification. We don't have a point system. What we have is you either are disabled or you are not. And that is our classification system. So when I hear about stories like Priscilla Gagne, who I had a great chat with, who was literally fighting someone. Like judo is not for the faint of heart. And she's out there tossing people over her head, getting tossed on her head. And somebody she, she is literally fighting might have a huge advantage of sight where she's completely blind. And, and I just thought that, that that is manipulation at its finest. And, and it blew my mind that that even exists. Now, uh, I'm actually way more fascinated from your perspective because you play a sport where there is a classification system. Like if you were up against a guy that was manipulating, how would you feel? Now, I hate to say it, but in our sport, there are athletes out there that have questionable classifications. And you really feel it when you play against them, where you know what it feels like to play against a two-pointer or a three-pointer. And when you see an athlete whose classification doesn't match up with their ability, it's frustrating. It makes you feel like you're playing against the system as well as the other athlete. And that can lead to athletes feeling disenfranchised and leaving the sport. And I think that's terrible. Do you think you'll ever see the day in ice hockey where there is a classification system where you see athletes with different disabilities being given different point values? You know what, it, it could happen. And I would never say never because uh, who knows which way the Paralympics are gonna go in terms of classification. Uh, for, for me, when I think about hockey and classification, it makes me think of like a salary cap where I know in wheelchair basketball and wheelchair rugby, you get a point value based on your disability. And I think always think about people making the team. And I think I put my I put my general manager hat on and I go, okay, I love this player at two. If he's a two out of five classification, I love this guy. But if he's a three, he's probably not making the team. And that is what I think about and that's what makes me very cautious about the classification system is you might be taking some amazing people from your program and not allowing them the chance to compete for Canada purely because they've been classified incorrectly. I think that's a great point. And I think we're seeing some of that in wheelchair rugby, especially because we're getting so many athletes with different disabilities now, where originally it was all spinal cord injuries. And now we're seeing everything from cerebral palsy to CMT to uh, hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy, all sorts of different disabilities. So. I think that we'll find a space for all of those athletes once the classification system gets updated to address all these different athletes with different disabilities. I remember when I was really young, the first, the first you know, accessible sport I ever played was wheelchair basketball. And I went and tried it out. Um, and I remember before I got classified, before a tournament, some of my teammates telling me things like, hey, struggle to bend over or you know maybe you can't touch your toes and you know have you seen any of those manipulations work uh, like actually when someone goes in and does it i think i think i've seen a ton of that and i think classifiers too have seen a ton of it okay. too and now that they've seen so much of it they're beginning to understand okay 
your disability doesn't affect your ability to bend over and reach over here and do this and do that. So classifiers are definitely becoming accustomed to that and getting wise to it. But I still think uh, there's definitely a lot of room to go in training our classifiers and specifically what to look for when they're classifying athletes. And don't you find that with parasport, sometimes it's about finding your niche and what sport works for you. Because uh, another thing, like Zach Medell, a, a guy that you know very well, he came out and tried para hockey, and he was good. He was great. But, but obviously, you know, you have to be a quad to play wheelchair rugby and, and have something affecting your limbs. And Zach Medell was a great hockey player. And then watching him transition, try other sports, and find wheelchair rugby, and now I watch him, he's one of the best players in the world. I love watching a, a, an athlete with a disability try different sports, find their niche, and then just watch them succeed. Like that's one of my favorite things. And it was amazing to see classification play a huge role in that where in hockey and in basketball, he was one of the more lesser functioning athletes in those given sports, but when he found that right sport, he just flourished and fell in love with it. And it was awesome to have a front row seat for all that. Thanks so much, Travis. I learned so much about classification today. Well, classification is one of those hot button topics that we could talk about all day, especially with how important it is to the Paralympic movement. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you for joining us today on Beyond the Field. Hosts Greg Westlake, Travis Murau, producer Ted Cooper, associate producer Alex Smythe, director of photography Matthew McGurk, videographers Andrew Pickup, Norman Germain, senior editor Matthew McGurk, Editors Nathan Clement, Daniel Waldman. Media Accessibility Specialist Ron Rickford. Audio Post Mark Phoenix. Color Adam Kemp. Graphics Mike Smith, Andrew Antonello. Narration Bill Hunt. Senior Producer Michelle Dudas. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2022 Accessible Media Inc.